Hello and welcome to the next webinar in our how to series from strengthening the heartland. My name is Amber Letcher. I'm one of the directors of this project and we're really excited that you could join us today to talk about a very important topic. Um, one That's probably um, very important to most of you on this call today. So um, before I introduce our speaker for today. I just have a couple housekeeping items for you in case you are new or if you just need some reminders of the logistics for our webinars. Please feel free to type questions that you have into the questions portal. Um, you will not see those questions as you type them in, but they will come to us on our end and then we'll save those to the end of the presentation when I'll relay them to our guest speaker. Um, also, you will see handouts for the presentation today so that you can follow along. Those are in the handout panel. And then lastly, you'll see a survey link. Uh, we love to get your feedback from the presentations we have. It helps us plan for upcoming events and uh, a lot of the recommendations that you make become our next uh, types of presentations, which was the case for our presentation today. So we're very excited. If you fill out that survey, you do have a chance to win a $25 gift card. So it's time very well spent. So please do that if you have a minute. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest speaker today, Stephanie Surdy. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I was so honored when I got the request to talk about this because it's a topic that I just really love and is close to my heart, and um, I feel like I've got some good experience and stories about. So um, I'm gonna start with just a little about me. Um, I've been working in the mental health field for 15 years um, in just various capacities. So I've started my work off um, in my undergraduate, I did in-home um, skills work. So I got to work in the home with families. Um, from that, I went and got my master's degree um, and got a, a master's degree in uh, marriage and family therapy and worked in private practice um, for several years up until um, the birth of my youngest child, who's now three, um, when I transitioned into a role as a county case manager um, in Minnesota. So I work with um, the county as a children's mental health case manager here. So um, in my work in the past, I had a lot of interest. Um, one of the first cases that I got when I did skills work and was working in the home was with a family who'd done adoption. Um, and it was one of those cases that, and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later today, but it was just very fascinating to me and it, it caused a big shift in my perspective on adoption and what it really looks like kind of behind closed doors. Um, so that was really what started everything. Um, after that, I've decided to get more education. Um, I have a lot of experience doing play therapy, um, a lot of interest in work with um, children and adults with trauma. Um, and so all of that stuff kind of goes hand in hand with kids who are in foster care. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about me. I was able to do um, a training and I did put a link to the um, the website for it, but it was a, com uh, um, oh my gosh, what was it? Permanency and Adoption Competency Certificate. Sorry, I had to think of that. Um, it was a 72 hour training and I got so much out of that about um, adoption and foster care. And it was just really geared at the experience of the kids. So I used a lot of that information to shape this presentation. Um, so I'm wondering, because I, you know, we, we're not really sure who's all here, if you could just tell me who's here today, um, what your role is, and what your relationship is to the foster care system. Um, and even if you don't have one, that's okay. You know what? And Amber's going to read off a couple of different ones. It just kind of helps me tailor my presentation to make sure that I am covering everybody. Yes, feel free to type those into that uh, questions panel. Let's see who's here today. Right, so we have a, a mental health crisis therapist, a foster parent, um, social workers, let's see, uh, business director, case managers, uh, some individuals from CASA, uh, graduate students. So uh, middle school counselors, looks like some 4-H um, extension individuals, parent educators, really good group. Awesome, yes, yeah. so diverse, I love it. 
Yeah, and hopefully um, there'll be something for each of you to take away from this. So thanks so much for putting that in. Um, so I wanted to start the presentation with just an invitation to be present. And I say this because, you know, we're very well versed in doing webinars now. Um, and I think one of my habits is to always have things going on in the background. So I have a webinar going and I'm doing 10 other things. So I understand if you have other things to do, but I just want to invite you to take this time for yourself, take it as time to learn and be present. And with that, um, we're going to do a quick breathing exercise. Um, so this is something that you can use and you can put in your toolkits for working with kids. Um, it's the hand breathing exercise. Amber, can you see me okay or am I getting too much sun here? There's a little bit of sun, but a I, bit I can still see it. Okay, yep. we'll just go <laughs> right over better. here. Yep. That's better. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Ah, sorry, sunny days, it's good, I love it. But um, So the hand model. Uh, and so this is something, like I said, that you can do with kids. Um, there's a lot of talk about this when COVID came out. It's good for you just to do too. And so hand model of breathing. So I'm going to invite you to do this with me. So all you do is you take your pointer finger and when you go up your finger, you breathe in. And then when you go down your finger, you breathe out. And so we're just going to do that. You can do it on your own. You can follow me um, just to get us started, get us in the right move, give our bodies regulated and calm. So breathe in. Hold and out. And you go up and breathe in. And out. Breathe in. And out. Two more times. Big breath in. And out. Last one. Big breath in. Hold it and out. And I do, I chose that one. Um, my kids have done a lot of breathing. Their teachers do different things for different times of the year. So there's leaf breathing, um, pumpkin breathing, but the hand, it's something you always have that's accessible and it's a good visual. Um, so one of the strategies that you can use to help kids regulate, and we'll talk more about that later. But um, so I have some learning objectives for you. My biggest goal is this first one. Practicing reframing negative behaviors into um, language that describes the expected stress reaction of a, of a child in foster care. Really what I want that to be is, I want you to shift your lens on this, and we're gonna talk about that. I want you to shift your lens from thinking about things as a behavioral problem to a symptom of their experiences. Um, we're gonna talk about three common behaviors, the hardest ones in my, in my um, experience with kids in foster care. Um, and then describe the critical need for mental health intervention. So last thing I promised with the chat, but I just wanted to know um, to start off with, if you could type in the chat, just a word or a phrase, or just what comes to mind when you hear the phrase foster kid, foster child. Um, and then Amber, if you'd be so kind to share those again. some responses coming in um trauma hardship some more trauma um, loneliness uh, in need of love and empathy need of help support in need of love oh my gosh and lost some more love challenging um, identity loss of identity I love that. I love that so many people thought of the trauma piece. So you, you're already ahead of the game. I love that. So thank you again for sharing. Um, what, what I want to talk about is a perspective and, and shifting a perspective. And it sounds like a lot of you already have a great perspective. So for you, maybe this is just going to be a review. But for others, this might be something that's a little bit new. Um, and I just had an incidence of this that really reminded me of how important this is. I was talking with a family member the other day about something random with surgery and she had an appointment with her doctor. Um, and her doctor is one of the foster care providers that I've worked with in the past. And he and his wife have taken on some really, really challenging cases. They're a wonderful family. Um, but the individual was saying how the doctor shared that he and his wife went on vacation and um, they ended up having to come back early because they have a foster child who's 13. Um, they're adopting her and that she was having a hard time. And the individual who was telling me the story said, I just, 
doesn't she know how good she has it? Like, why would she act that way? She lives with a doctor. You know, they're just the nicest people. Like she, she just needs to learn to be grateful. Um, and in, in the work that we do for most of us, we're surrounded so much, I think by people that are like-minded that I forget sometimes that there's people who, who really do have that notion that you take these kids from a bad home, you put them in a new home, and things should be better, or you just give them enough love and things should be better. And unfortunately, that's not the case. That's still needed, it's still necessary, um, but it's just not always enough. So one of the, the things that was um, shared was challenging, um, definitely. So what I invite people to do is to shift their lens. Instead of looking at the behaviors, um, looking at the, and wondering about what happened to you. And for people who are Oprah fans or like Bruce Perry, she has a new book called What Happened to You. It's a great read. Um, but it's all about looking at people's histories and questioning how they impacted them. So what we know about foster care is that the most common reasons that kids go into foster care is because of neglect, um, physical or sexual abuse, and then parent substance abuse. Um, and so all of those things would be considered a form of trauma. Um, and so when I operate, when I'm working with these families, I look at things from a foster, from a trauma lens. Um, and so I'm, I want to shift our perspective to that, to what was, when we look at these children and they come to us, what was your life like before and how did these behaviors serve you? Um, so when kids come to us, and this is really true for anybody, we all have our, you know, some people call it baggage, but um, children in foster care especially come to us with what um, people refer to as an invisible suitcase. So what they bring with them about their beliefs about the world. And the reason why it's so important um, to know this about them is that their invisible suitcase is full of things that maybe aren't in other kids' suitcase. Um, so in the illustration, you can see it says, you know, this these core beliefs, no one loves me, it's all my fault, um, grown-ups lie, grown-ups hurt me, I'm a bad kid, I'm stupid, um, I can't trust anyone, and so these beliefs are what they bring with them into all situations and what they see the world through. So this was one of the more powerful things I think that I took from that pack training that I did, and it's something that I keep in mind for all of the kids that I work with, is that part of my job is to understand what they carry with them and what their beliefs are. Because once I know that, it really helps me understand how to relate to them, how to connect to them and how to help them. So since we have some foster parents, we have um, educators, we have people who are working at 4-H. I mean, I, I think this applies to all of you, but one of the things that happens with a lot of these kids that come into the foster system is that it's a sudden thing. You know, they're in an unsafe position and they get shifted into a foster home. And, and unfortunately, um, there's not always a lot of time to give the family, the teachers, whoever new information or to give them the information about them. And so sometimes that becomes the job of the people that surround them. Um, there's been cases where, you know, it, they can barely give the foster parents their, their ages and their medical history. So sometimes these kids are coming in and there's very little background information. And so what's important is that we, as the people who work with them, try to get that information in whatever means we can. So whether it's, you know, asking the child protection worker questions that then they can ask family members, if it's reaching out to the teachers um, or people that were involved in this child's life prior to foster placement and just asking things like, what are some things they like? What are some things you know that they really don't like? Um, any information that you get is going to help you connect with these kiddos. Um, and it, it'll help you inform interventions. Um, so one thing I think of is some of the kids who are going to be coming into these homes are going to hate physical touch. It's going to be, they're going to have an aversion to it. It's going to be a trick. So even finding out, you know, like how they respond to that. Other kids, physical touch may be safe and they might actually need some of it, you know, some of the deep pressure stuff to calm. So getting any of that information is going to help with forming that connection and really getting to know um, the child that's coming into your care or into your classroom. Also, anything that you can get to know about their past experiences, um, there's a very big difference between um, neglect 
and how kids who've been neglected present versus kids who um, have been physically abused. With neglect, um, there isn't typically a pattern to it like there is with abuse, and so the kids can be a little bit more scattered. And it's actually been proven to be more harmful um, because of the fact that there's no predictability to it. Um, so I think a lot of times we think like, oh, physical or sexual abuse has got to be the worst. Um, but because there's some patterns and predictability to it, um, and the kids can almost like gain a sense of control through that, like noticing the patterns and the predictability, um, a lot of times they're less impacted as kids who've experienced neglect just because there isn't that pattern. So it's just important to kind of know what experiences they had, maybe how old they were when it started, things of that nature. So the next thing when, when these kiddos come to you is your job and part of advocating for them and part of um, helping them is going to be building attachment and connection. Um, there's a phrase that one of my, my own ch um, children's teachers used and she said connection before correction and I love that phrase and I think that's true for for any kid. So before you go in and you want to start correcting behaviors, fixing things, doing all of that, it's so important to build that connection. And so I put a couple of simple ways that you can start to build that, um, even with little to no information about these kiddos. Um, one of the things that I love to do is, and I try to do is, they're called noticing techniques. Um, and so we're in a world where we use the phrase good job all the time. I do it myself. I try to catch myself. It's great. We want kids to feel like they're doing a great job. The problem is that it gives kids this external, um, not rule, but external praise instead of teaching them to look into themselves. And so noticing techniques are as simple as just um, saying to a child, let's say they're coloring a picture and you can see that they're coloring within the lines, just saying, wow, you were able to do that whole thing staying in the lines and you leave out any of the evaluator, like evaluative phrases. So no good job, no I love it, nothing like that. And what that does is helps them to be seen, but it also triggers this internal process of saying, oh, wow, I'm doing a good job, and they start to do that themselves. Also, kids who go into the system and kids who come from backgrounds like this don't always have a good sense of self. So even just noticing in them helps them feel seen. So it might be, wow, you're wearing really bright colors today, you, or um, if they did their hair, you worked really hard on getting your hair to look like that. Just little things like that can make a big impact. Um, another thing is routines and predictability are gonna be really important, whether that be in the classroom um, or in your, in your home, um, in therapy. And so that might look like having the same routine in the morning. So you eat breakfast, you get your shoes on, you go to the bus. Um, and having like a welcome home routine. So you get off the bus, you have a fruit, like an apple for a snack, you read a story, and then you do homework. Um, just things that are predictable are going to help create a feeling or a sense of felt safety. One of the things with kids um, who are in foster care is we look at them and we say like, you're safe, you're in a safe place. And there's a difference between actual safety and felt safety. And so, what's important is to try to create experiences and try to do things to help them with the felt safety. So routines, predictability is going to help with that aspect of it. Um, boundaries are important to set right away. And when I say boundaries, some people think it's kind of like a bad word, but boundaries are just rules and guidelines for them so that they know what to expect. So it might be, you know, what the boundaries are with food or what the boundaries are, what do you expect with meals? Um, What's acceptable as far as physical affection? You know, do you like hugs? Do you prefer that they ask first? Things of that nature, just so that they know kind of where where they lie. Um, they're likely going to push them, but if they know where they are, that process will go much quicker um, because they're going to kind of know what the boundaries are and they're not going to have to do as much testing. Um, lastly, follow through is going to be huge. So if you say that you're going to do something, um, you need to work really hard to do it. So I encourage people who work with these kiddos, and I mean, really in general, don't make promises. Um, you know, say, let's say that you have a trip planned to the zoo on Saturday, um, and you tell them like that you're gonna go to the zoo. Give the caveat of, 
as long as the weather holds up, we're going to the zoo. So they know that there's this other piece that it could um, potentially fall through. If you're gonna be there at three o'clock to pick them up, be there at three o'clock to pick them up. Things like that mean a lot to them. And it might not seem like much, but that goes back to that predictability um, piece and consistency that's gonna be so huge. Okay, so challenging behaviors. There's three that I picked out that I feel like are the most difficult for um, foster parents, society, everyone to kind of deal with, uh, lying, stealing, and raging. Um, those are three of the more common difficult behaviors. Um, and so again, when we are looking at kids who are displaying this kind of thing, I'm gonna ask that you use this new perspective, um, take on the trauma lens, and look at it from the standpoint of what happened to you, and more importantly, how did this behavior serve you? Um, when it comes to these behaviors, especially lying and stealing, I think one of the most difficult things for us as a society, as just whatever our roles are, educators, foster parents, is that we personalize them. So when somebody lies to you, it's so hard not to feel like, oh, how could you, you know, I, thought, I trusted you. Um, or stealing, you personalize it. How could they take something from me? You know, that's mine. Like, don't they, don't they respect me? Um, and when it comes to kids who have backgrounds like these kids do, when they come from places of neglect, parents with substance abuse, um, unpredictable histories, these behaviors become more than just the behaviors. Um, they're, they're survival techniques for some of them. Um, and so, off the bat, I just encourage people not to personalize these behaviors because nine times out of 10, they really have nothing to do with you. These kids are living in an egocentric world because that's what they've had to be in to protect themselves. Um, I'm gonna tell a story that happened this week at work just to kind of illustrate this. Um, and then we'll get into more about each one of the behaviors. But um, a colleague of mine works with a teenager who's been adopted. Um, he had a history of neglect, abuse, um, and I believe he was adopted when he was like six. Um, so he had a, a pretty long stint of experiencing that, that pathogenic care in his early years, um, has been in a stable home, same, um, you know, the foster parents eventually adopted him. Um, he has skills workers, he's got um, therapists, he's got an IEP, so he has tons of resources. Um, so this kiddo was at school um, in his special education room and he has an IEP. People know that he has a history of stealing and that food is a big trigger for him. Um, and he is supposed to have a one-to-one -one para at all times. So kiddo is in his special education room. The special education teacher leaves for a little while. Um, while the educator is gone, child goes through the cupboards and finds a cupcake that was given to this educator for his birthday. Child then eats the cupcake, which is to be expected given his history. Um, educator comes back, finds that his cupcake has been eaten and is furious. Um, it becomes a big deal. He obviously contacts mom, talks about potentially pressing charges against this child. Um, and then for the doesn't talk to the child. Um, and while we don't want to reinforce stealing, I felt like that was such a perfect example of personalizing a behavior. Um, so this kiddo has food insecurity. He will probably always have food insecurity. He's afraid that there's never going to be enough. And um, so if he has the opportunity to take food, he's going to do it because he still has a mindset even after being um, cared for consistently for six, seven, eight years, that food could potentially go away, that he might not have another opportunity to have it. And so in that instance, he took the cupcake. Um, so this is one of those those situations where I feel like it's so important to have this information. And so luckily he has a mom who gets it and he has um, my coworker who gets it and she's going to advocate for him. But there's just, there's some issues with how this educator who knows him, who's worked with him, who knows his IEP handled the situation. And I definitely think he was handling it from a personalization. He personalized that behavior. Um, more logical consequence I think would be having him, the kiddo work at home to do some extra chores to be able to pay for a replacement cupcake for the teacher that then would be given to him. And obviously it's okay for the teacher to be disappointed, but um, not talking to him for a couple of days feels a little bit extreme. So it's still 
difficult for people, even who are in the, you know, the education realm, special education realm. So I just think that illustrates that point. Um, so for lying, lying is a common behavior. One thing that we tend to do um, as parents, as just individuals, is when people are, if we're concerned that somebody's telling us a lie, we're going to ask them about the thing that we think they're lying about to see that if they'll tell us the truth. So this might be, you know, did you take that cupcake? Um, when we already know the answer. And so for going back to that example, instead of saying, did you take that cupcake? Because what that does is provides them with an opportunity to lie. You give them the information. You say, I know that you took that cupcake. And now we need to figure out how we're going to um, remedy this situation, like how we're going to fix it. And so, and the kid might say, no, 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 I didn't. And then you just, again, remind them like the cupcake was there. I know you were the only one in the room. So let's try to figure out how we're going to address this situation. Um, and then provide a logical consequence. If you go into um, asking them repeatedly if they did something, why they did it, things like that. First of all, the child might not know why they did it. It's such an impulse. And second of all, it's it triggers things within us, which makes it hard for us to stay calm. So when somebody repeatedly lies to you, it's really hard to stay in that calm place. So don't ask. If you know that they did something, just give them the information you have. Don't allow for more conversation about it. They will probably not admit to it. And if they do, it'll be a couple days later because um, being challenged on things like that is going to put them kind of in their, their own trauma response. And so it might take a little bit of time before they can come back to it. Again, not about you. It's, it's about them and, and their experiences. Um, oops. There we go. Stealing. Um, okay, so I talked about this kiddo who I said had some food insecurities. Pretty common with a lot of these kiddos who are coming in if there was a history of neglect or if parents um, have used substances just because food, first of all, it may have been there, but maybe there wasn't a parent who was able to make it for them. Um, and so many of the kids who come from these backgrounds have some unhealthy relationships with food where they're just kind of not convinced that it's always going to be there. Um, and so it's important to know that because it's such a different framework from a typical developing child or a child who hasn't had that experience because they have no concerns about it. Where even, even though you can tell these children over and over again, like there's food, there's food, we have food, do you see the food, the cupboards are full, it's still within them. Um, so something that I recommend for at school or at home or even at um, like practices, if they're involved in sports or 4-H, is that they know that there's food that's readily available. Um, and obviously you're not gonna have cupcakes sitting out, but having a discussion at home maybe about how there is always fruit. Fruit is always sitting out and you are welcome to have it. It is always yours. Snacks are for special times, but or treats or snacks or cakes, whatever, are for special times, but there is always food and having it within sight is good. So part of that might be like in the school study, packing a snack so that they know that they always have a snack in their backpack. Um, and if they steal food or they come home with extra candy, if they do things like that, again, confronting them from the standpoint of, I know that you didn't leave with this, so I just need to know who to return it to. Um, if you find that they're eating or they're taking food from other kids, again, resort to those logical consequences. Um, and this is by far the hardest one for kids to break. Um, no matter how long they're in a stable environment, the food thing is just, it lingers for a long time. And I don't know specifically why that is. I just know in all of my work that I can have kids who've been in um, stable homes since the age of two and they still have food insecurity. It's just really ingrained in them, so it's tough. So rages and regulation. Um, again, this isn't every kid, but a lot of uh, kiddos who have experience of early neglect or abuse um, have a difficult time with regulating their body. Either A, they weren't taught how to regulate because we teach our, our children how to regulate through co-regulation, um, or due to all of the, the trauma that they've experienced or all of the uncertainty, their systems aren't wired to just automatically regulate. Um, so when kids rage, there's, it's typically not so much about like being told no or not getting their way. It's typically, I like to label it, label it as dysregulation. Their body is unable to regulate in some of those moments. Um, and I think even just having that language about it helps 
words are important. And if we call things like tantrums um, or outbursts or things like that, there's a connotation with that, that they have more control over it, where I feel like dysregulation really speaks to the fact that they aren't able to get their body to a calm state. So when kids are having these, these rages or kind of having these behaviors or outbursts, whatever you want to call them, um, a lot of times they're going to require somebody to co-regulate with them. And that might look different for every kid, which is why I say go back to the information that we have. So if we know that a kid likes um, deep pressure touches, that might be how we help regulate them. You might do some um, joint compressions where you take your two hands on your joint and push together, do it up here, um, do deep pressure touches and just kind of do that on their shoulders and down their arms. Um, if it's a kiddo who doesn't like to be touched and that isn't something that feels good to them, that's when you're gonna wanna go to like deep breathing. Um, when we're calming and regulating kids, we don't wanna use a lot of words. Um, when they're in this state, and we're, we're gonna get to the hand model of the brain that'll explain it a little bit more, but their logical brains aren't working. They're very much in fight, flight, freeze. Um, and in those, in, when they're in that reaction, our job is to help ground them, bring them back to the present. Um, so that then we can work on whatever it is that's going on um, until they're out of that freeze, like fight, fight or freeze response. There's really, they're not able to take any of the things that we're saying inward. And so our job is to help them get to that, that point of calm. And then I would say, even after that, give it a good 30 minutes before you start in with the, like, this is how we could do things. Cause we want to really make sure that they're at that calm stage, their body's regulated before we start in with that again. Um, and you keeping calm and you staying regulated is key. If you're not regulated, you can't regulate. Um, and so for the foster parents who are listening to this tag team, um, if you have the ability to take to your part, you feel that you're starting to, you can feel that you're getting frustrated, you can feel that you're um, losing some of your control, tag teaming is so important. Tag the other parent in to take over because some of these rages can last a really long time and it's, it's tough. Um, in classrooms, I would say if you can take the child or have somebody take the child out of the classroom, not necessarily into like a calm down room, but just even to get them into a hall or a place where there's maybe less commotion, um, that also helps a lot too, just to kind of reduce all of the things going on around them. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the hand model of the brain. Um, I was going to show a video, but they don't work very well. Um, on here and I didn't want to go through the freezing so you are going to get me teaching you this um, but I did in the resources I included two different videos um, one is um, a therapist doing it and then the second video is my friend's daughter who did a very good job uh, making a video about how to use the hand model of the brain it's very cute so um, they're good she made it specifically for kids so it's a good thing to share with kids and I think you know, some schools are starting to do this um, just for all of their kids, because this is something that happens to all of us. Um, we can, we all operate this way. Um, so the hand model of the brain. So you use your hand. This area right here is to represent the brain stem, which is just our most primitive functioning. It's breathing. It's, um, they call it the reptilian brain. And so this, this area, that's what it does. It just basically is us making sure we're alive. Um, and so you can use your thumb, and sorry, I'm getting sun again, but the thumb is your amygdala. Um, and don't worry, I'm only gonna do one more brain term because sometimes it gets a little heavy, but your amygdala is important, especially for these kids. It's your fear center. Um, so it's your big emotions, it's your fight, flight, freeze response. Um, and with kids who have histories of trauma, abuse, neglect, their amygdala is gonna be much more active than your typical developing child. So then what kind of holds that all in together? This is your prefrontal cortex. And that is your rational brain. That's your executive functioning. This is your regulation, um, your empathy, how you connect with people. It's all of your higher functionings. Like I said, rationale, understanding. Um, so this is your brain functioning in perfect harmony. Um, but what happens to some of us and to these kids is that we say that they flip their lid. So their prefrontal cortex goes up and they're operating off of their brainstem and their amygdala, which is very primitive responses. And you can see when kids flip their lid, it's going to look like those rages. Um, they're going to look dis disorganized. Um, they might 
sorry, they might um, present with some regressive tendencies. So um, yelling, screaming, kind of kicking, doing things like that because they're going into that more primitive state. So when their lids are flipped, our job is to work with them to do those strategies that we talked about to button that back up so that they can start operating using all of those other functioning, um, all of those other functions of their brain so that they can get back to reason, that they can get back to calming. I um, mean, so to do that, you have to do those grounding techniques that we kind of talked about to help them with that. And so um, we have kids that we work with who we teach this to, like I said, some schools do. One of the little ones that I work with calls it mixed up monkeys when she's like this. And there's in the video, they talk about like different animals. Um, and so it just helps them start to identify with their feelings and give them a phrase. So some kids will just like put a hand up like this and it gives them a way to say like, mm -mm, I'm not, I'm not okay right now. And I'm going to need some help without having to say those words. So just, um, it's a good reminder and a good model to think of when you see some of the behaviors coming out of the kids. Dan Siegel also refers to it as upstairs and downstairs brain. And so when we're in our upstairs brain, we're doing really well. When our downstairs brain, we're starting to get angry. We're kind of acting out. So two different ways that you can think about it. Um, but just good to know. And like I said, for us too, because we flip our lids. Some of the strategies that you can use um, for kids when they're having these rages um, mindfulness strategies, so just being in the present. Um, some of the things that you can do are um, using their senses. So three things you can hear, three things you can feel, three things you can see. Um, yoga, there is some awesome cosmic yoga um, for kids. I know that we had a program around here where teenagers were able to do yoga. Um, the benefits are just unreal um, for these kids and learning how to regulate their bodies. So it's like I said, the Cosmic Kids Yoga, it's free on YouTube. Um, it's fun. So it's great for them connecting their mind to body. Um, deep breathing, even just the techniques that I showed you with the hand. Um, some people will do birthday candles or blowing petals on a flower. Physical touch, again, if they're comfortable with it, it can be really helpful doing those deep pressure, those joint compressions, things like that can help bring them back into their body and also sensory experiences. So um, like I said, noticing things that they smell or even providing sensory experiences for them. For some kids um, in one of the models, they use lotion um, as like a calming strategy. Um, and so even just saying, oh gosh, it seems like you've had a hard day. How about we do some lotion on your hands um, or lotion on your arms? And that sensory process, even if these kids haven't had that experience, it brings us back to when we were little and our parents put lotion on us and it can be very calming. Plus there's the smell that goes along with it too. And for those of you who like essential oils, also great sensory experiences. Lavender is wonderful. So referrals. One of the other, I would say, common misconceptions um, with this population is that the child protection worker has kind of taken care of all of the referrals or that they're providing all of this. Um, and so as a case manager, we'll, we have a really good relationship with our child protection team and they know that if they have a kid that they're putting in placement, um, that we're there to support them, getting them all the needs met. Um, so child protection workers don't always do all of these referrals. Um, and so there's, there's a whole, um, host of things that can be helpful, but I feel like one of the most important things, and this is probably for every child who's in foster care, is to get them into outpatient therapy, um, outpatient mental health therapy. When we think about kids going into foster care and we talk about trauma, um, depending on their age, it can be a really significant experience for them, whether it's good or bad, or like I said, if they're leaving a house that wasn't safe, but going into a safe space, it's a lot to process. Um, and so getting them in for outpatient therapy to be evaluated just to connect with a provider and to have that service in place, I would say every child should have that who's been put into the foster system just to even process the experience of moving to a new home. The sooner that they process it, the better. The longer that you wait, the harder it is for them to process it. So that's going to be huge. Also, for um, foster parents, support.
an incredibly hard job and having an outpatient therapy or outpatient therapist, um, even if it's for the child, gives you somebody that you can look to for suggestions, um, for resources, and sometimes just to go in and say, oh my gosh, this has been really tough and to, to get some support in terms of that. Um, with the younger population, um, I would say eight and under because some of these kids, and, and this is flexible I should, with those ages, but I'm a strong advocate for play-based therapy um, with a lot of kids who have this type of trauma, who are in foster care, their experiences can be pre-verbal. They're early on, um, their body can hold on to it. And so doing interactive therapy or play-based therapy is what helps them get at those early experiences and work through them. Um, kids really aren't able to do cognitive processing or, or like traditional talk therapy until after the age of eight because of how their brain develops. Um, and even, you know, there was times that we would do play therapy with like 13 year olds who had experience or had um, traumatic experiences when they were five because they needed to go back and heal that five year old self. Um, so I'm a strong advocate for that interactive therapy for the young ones. Um, and on the website that I gave you the um, the one for it's the Center for um, Case is the one that I gave you. It has a list in every state of providers who've been trained in the permanency and adoption competency certificate. Um, so that's a good resource too. I'm sure that there's some in North Dakota and South Dakota as well. Um, also having somebody who specializes in some attachment-based therapy is gonna be important. Um, something that I learned along the way was, you know, initially in the start of my career, I was hesitant to engage foster parents in attachment therapy um, because there was that fear of like, what if this kiddo attaches to this foster parent? and then foster care isn't forever. But what research shows and what we learned is that if kids can form an attachment to someone, it can be transferred. And so involving foster parents in that isn't going to harm them. It's not going to make the loss of that foster provider any more difficult. Um, providing these kids with the ability to form a healthy attachment is gonna serve them lifelong. Um, so don't be afraid to do attachment-based work as a foster care provider. Um, it can be transitioned. Another important thing to look into um, is psychological testing. Um, depending on when these experiences happen to the kids, their brains can form very differently. Um, you know, prior it, pathogenic care prior to the age of two can really impact um, parts of the brain that help the right side and the left side communicate. Um, and so doing psychological testing to kind of figure out where they fall, how they learn best can be really important, especially in the education setting. Um, some of these kids, I had um, one that I worked with and she was six years old and she could read and spell and write and just was way beyond her years. Um, she went into kindergarten, able to read and able to spell out like full sentences, super smart. She had to be, she had that survival skill because her parents weren't taking care of her. And so she taught herself to read, but her ability to understand what she was reading and comprehend was not there. So even though some of these kiddos can present like they've got it, they're really smart. Some of those are survival smarts and there's still pieces that are missing. So psychological testing can be really helpful with that. Um, occupational therapy. So, um, with talking about kids getting dysregulated um, and having their amygdala be a little bit more reactive, occupational therapy can really help kids get more control and more comfortable within their body. Um, so when we talk about kids who've experienced trauma or kids who've experienced abuse, occupational therapy can really be a nice addition to be able to help with that calming, regulating, um, and getting them to a place where they feel more comfortable with their body because our body is what holds on to the trauma that we experience. And so the more comfort that they have with it, the more control they have over it, the better it goes. Um, case management, that's what my position is now. I think um, it's, it's a free service. Uh, I think that it's so important, especially for the foster um, parents because it's somebody who can help manage all these other services or somebody who can help make the referrals um, and somebody who can be an advocate. So case management services are through the county. Um, like I said, they're free, they don't cost money. Um, I think most of these kiddos come with some pretty complex 
behaviors, complex histories. And so having somebody who can kind of help you keep track of all that stuff, help arrange transportation is just a really good resource. Um, and then school-based services and the school providers on here, um, you probably have worked with many of these kids and um, so 504 plans, IEPs, and, and I'm not gonna say that you jump to them right away, but it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind and to have conversations with school about. Um, if you're bringing a, a kid to a new school that isn't familiar with them, just giving them that information, as much information as you can. Um, and just, I really believe in front loading. So um, giving people more information than maybe they even need, not that we're sharing lots of private information, but just more information so that when things come up, they have that to fall on. So if you have a kiddo who, you're, who um, may steal food or who gets dysregulated easily, talking to that teacher, the um, educational professional beforehand and preparing them is really going to help both them and the child. Um, and like I said, not every kid is gonna need an IEP or a 504. It's just something really good to have in your, in your mind and let them know that you're thinking about. Is a quote that I want to leave you with. Um, in my world, there are no bad kids, just impressionable, conflicted young people wrestling with emotions and impulses, trying to communicate their feelings and needs the only way they know how. And I just feel like that sums up so much about these kids in foster care and kids in general. Um, and that it, it goes back into that lens of people are doing the best they can with what they have. Um, and a lot of times these kids are doing the best they can with the experiences, the resources, um, the skills that they have. So I just like that quote. So we will go into questions. And I also, um, in the handout that you will get, I have my email. So if there's something that you come up with later, please feel free to email me. Like I said, this is a topic that's really near and dear to me. So I love to talk about it. I'd love to answer questions. Um, and then I did put on um, our website um, for a mental health consulting company that I'm also part of. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I was taking a lot of notes because <laughs> I refer to them and um, also talk about them in, in my classes as well with students. So thank you. Um, we do have a couple questions in oh, the chat and if there are others, please take some time to type those in um, as we're discussing. We've got some time yet for questions. So the first one was, will these items, some of the tips that you gave, they're appropriate for high school students as well as the younger kids? I would say it depends on the kids, but yes. Um, some of the breathing exercises, the yoga, mindfulness, those kind of strategies. Um, it also depends. So the thing with high school kids is that a lot of them are, you know, walking around in 16, 17, 18 year old bodies, but really their developmental age is more like eight or nine. So I guess my advice would be try to figure out kind of where their develop, not their developmental age, their emotional ages. Um, yeah, their developmental slash emotional ages and, and parent and base your interventions off of that. Um, so again, they might be 16, but some 16 year olds I've worked with are like five and that's what they need when they're in a state of dysregulation or if they're struggling. Um, so, and the breathing exercises, um, you can tailor that to be for older kids too. I know a lot of watches, my watch has like a breathing app on it that has a visual. Um, you can do things like that too. So it feels more age appropriate, but yes, I would say most of them work for high school kids as well. Um, another question, um, what suggestions do you have for single parents who are foster parents? So uh, when those kids are raging or having regulation issues, any tips if you don't have someone to tag out with? Yeah, absolutely. And kudos to you for doing that. What a hard, it's a hard role to, to provide foster care and especially as a single person. Um, so in those moments, I think that giving yourself breaks, if possible, obviously, um, if the child is raging and not safe, you're not able to do that. Um, but if they're just kind of having a meltdown and you can get them to their bedroom or a room where they can kind of be at a lot of houses, they'll have like calm down spaces. 
um, if you have one of those, getting them to that space and then even going outside for a couple minutes, leave the door open so you can hear them, but just getting out of the thick of it, even like I said, for a couple minutes, taking some deep breaths, um, just getting yourself to a place where your lid is covered, you're, you're not flipping your lid, you're not getting emotional, I mean, you can be rational because depending on our own experiences and just natural human instinct and nature is when people are getting big, we match them. And so if somebody's in a rage or they're getting really big or they're really angry, it's really hard to not match that same thing. Um, so if you can take breaks, if it means going to the bathroom and just locking the door for a couple of minutes, obviously safety is important, but um, taking that time I just listened to um, a podcast with Brene Brown and Glennon Doyle, and they talked about how um, in those moments when you are getting to that point of overwhelm, or she calls it burnt, I'm burnt, um, you need to do like pretty much nothing. Don't go read a book. Don't go to your phone. The only way when you're that far gone to come back is to do pretty much nothing. So stand outside, smell, smell the air, listen to the leaves listen to the birds, something like that to bring you back down. I really like that. I feel like anything to engage those senses that brings them kind of back down. Yes. Um, another question here. Um, someone has had some cases with kids who um, were wetting the bed and um, is that something that you see commonly? And if so, are there any you know, interventions or things that you can do to help with that? Yes, super common, um, especially with kiddos who've experienced sexual abuse. Um, that was one of kind of our warning signs um, in therapy. And one of the things that they would tell us that even if we didn't know about sexual abuse, um, it'd be kind of like, a, Ooh, I'm gonna tuck that in my hat or remember that for later. Um, it also can be common because of kids who are in this heightened state of fight, flight, or freeze, their bodies are tenser. And so throughout the day, their bodies are tense. So think of them as being like, you know, tight. And then when they go to sleep, they relax, muscles relax. And then like they wet the bed and accidents happen. So yes, super common, can be really difficult to address because again, you're working on that body trauma. Um, so I feel like it's like a multifaceted approach. OT can help because they can gain more control over their body, doing some of that co-regulation and getting them to calm down during the day so that they can actually start to be in touch with their body. Um, with that also, mindfulness is so important. So doing body scans and checking in, um, and that can be as simple as just saying like, all right, we're gonna sit here, let's check in. How does our head feel? And going through the whole body just to bring that awareness. Um, but yes, unfortunately, super common. Um, somewhat hard to address. We always recommend that you don't shame because they don't have control over it. Um, so what a lot of people do is if they wet the bed, then they just know that their job is, I mean, if they're old enough, you just clean off the bed, put it in the dryer or the washer, put it in the dryer, make your bed again. And that's not to be um, like shaming that they have to like take care of it, but it's just, it's, it gives them a sense of responsibility within it too. So Excellent. Um, so someone is working with a 13 year old girl who is autistic and she's wondering about um, breathing exercises. Are those things that you would recommend or any other specific strategies for um, youth on the autism spectrum? Always such a hard question. No, it's a good question. It's just it's tough because I feel like especially with um, autism, spectrum disorder, I mean, it says it in there, there's such a huge range of functioning. And so with high functioning kids, absolutely. I think our, our brains and our nervous system, every single person can benefit from these regulation strategies from the breathing. There's studies that show um, the benefits of, I mean, there's even different ways like left nostril to right nostril and the benefits that they have on you. There's just, there's these huge benefits. I think deep breathing doesn't get enough credit. Um, so if you can do that with them, if they're higher functioning, absolutely. Um, the body work might be something that you have to watch out for. Um, some kids with autism need that deep pressure, some don't. So I think um, 
if they have an OT going based off of that or just what you know their sensory preferences are. And it might be mirroring. So you might just have to sit across from them and kind of show them. And sometimes when kids are dysregulated, you can just do like a really, I want to say not like, a, like do really um, loud breathing so that they're hearing you. So you're so that they're just hearing that in the background. Um, and that's enough even just to hear that sometimes it can be calming and they might pick up on it. Um, people typically, if, if somebody is, um, if somebody's sitting next to you doing breathing like that loudly, you will start to modulate like with them. So um, for the people who are the kids who are more on the like um, more lower functioning on the autism spectrum, that's where I would kind of go with that. And it might be also just even like taking if they're okay with it and putting it on you and doing that deep breathing so that they can feel it too. Hopefully that helps. Um, some really good questions in here. Another one is this is also a, a really broad group, and we probably do another whole webinar here. But um, any specific recommendations about youth who identify as LGBT um, specifically? So that's another. There's so many common things I should, you know, working with this population, and I think kids, uh, just even kids who haven't had this experience, are struggling. But when I think of LGBTQ, and not to say this in like a, a negative way, but to me, it says identity, and I think identity is something that a lot of these kids struggle to find. Um, and we see some of the kids kind of in foster care who don't have that strong sense of identity questioning some of that stuff. Again, not to say that it's not um, if it's not true, you don't want to disregard it, but it, it it is pretty common because they don't have that set identity or a strong sense of self. Um, so I think one of the the ways that I would approach it is acceptance. So making sure that whatever they're telling you, and, and I know that that can be hard, um, that there's some acceptance with it. Another, again, not to disregard, they may wholeheartedly um, be LGBTQ, but something that we see with kids is a lot of testing. And so sometimes they might throw things at you just to test it. They might come to you and say, I have to tell you something, I'm gay, because they want to see what your response is and they want to see that acceptance. And so giving them that acceptance piece. And then I think um, if you can find a therapist, because obviously if kids are identifying as LGBTQ, we're looking at potentially, I mean, some kids do at younger ages, but we're looking at a little bit older population, but somebody who has some, some specialty in that or identifies as a safe person um, for that community so that they feel like that's being, it's being honored um, and that they have somebody that they can talk to who would understand that. So outpatient therapist, and just, you wanna check for that. A lot of the people who work with LGBTQ population or specialize in it um, will have that in their profiles if you look them up or their bios. Excellent. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions in the the chat, but um, I'm sure if there are th things that come up, um, Stephanie's email is there. I'm sure you'd be happy to answer those questions outside of the webinar. Thank you so much again. Just tons of tips. This was wonderful. Um, I'm going to put another plug in for finishing our survey. So please take a minute. It's really quick. Um, get yourself uh, registered for a chance to win that $25 gift card. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all for attending and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.